Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here with you. I, I wanted to uh, thank those of you especially whose native tongue is not English. I don't know how you do it. It's, uh, it's a remarkable accomplishment to listen all day long in your native language, but then to listen in a language other than your native language and translate and it's, it's uh, magic, just magic. And I imagine it uses the neurons in your brain so much more that you'll live longer and be healthier and whoa. Uh, I'm from San Francisco, California. And uh, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, my mother, French, my father from Scotland, like many Americans, a melange of, of backgrounds. And uh, I had the, the good fortune to learn very young uh, a great re respect for the differences among peoples uh, and to seek the similarities always looking to uh, be one of those California kids, and I couldn't quite do it, and didn't realize that it would be a great gift, that I couldn't do it. <laughs> so in California, I was, you know, the, the little foreign girl, and um, it, it served me well. I found the foreignness in each of my friends, and we united as the foreigners of the schools of California and um, quickly created a, a sort of a new uh, interest in, in diversity. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is what I call ontological leadership. I did not make up that word, of course. Ontology, the study of beingness. So the human beingness, not the human doingness, which, which we've become very efficient at, human doing this, which is also essential, as some of our speakers and Kirsten was just making clear that we know, that without the, the design, the financial design, without having in place for your, your business or your family, um, the, the design of, of everything from uh, the fundamentals, from schedules and finances and logistics and having a house and a roof and a home, all of that, of course, is essential. And uh, I count on you not to forget that. But what I'd like to talk about is what about the beingness and what relationship does it have to leadership and what relationship do you have to your own leadership, um, given that I hope the person in your chair, in your seat, is the leader of your life and the leader of, as a parent of your children and in the leader from whatever your role in your company, I hope you're providing your leadership, your unique, authentic expression of self, your perspective and point of view that only you have because of your design. I think that that is your job as a human being is to provide that which is your unique gift to the recipe, um, the meal, uh, of life. So I'm going to offer just a few little, uh, I don't know if they're hints or ideas uh, for you in terms of leadership and tell you where I got them, first of all. That So in the earlier decades of my career, I was a leader in the nonprofit sector. We, liked, we in the nonprofit sector like to call it the social profit sector because there's great profit to society in the nonprofit sector. Perhaps it's not financial profit that we aim at. Um, however, the outcome is a, a, a gift to the greater good. 
So we called ourselves the social profit sector or the mission-driven sector. So rather than focusing on financial profit to the shareholder, we focused on social profit to the recipients of the programs and ultimately to society overall. For what are we if we are not taking care of our children? Who are we as human beings if we allow children to die of hunger and hunger-related disease, for example, when it need no longer be, then what does that say about us as a community, as a society? So it's you can see that in the mission-driven field or the social profit field, it's very easy to get yourself and others extremely enthusiastic and passionate about the mission. The mission of the first nonprofit that I led was to reduce infant mortality rate around the world so that the number of infants who died in the first year of life per 1,000 live births would get beneath 50, which is a measurement, the IMR, the infant mortality rate, for the general health and well-being of a community. I love that as a measurement. How are our babies living? If our babies are living, we're doing pretty well as a community, a human community. If our babies are dying in the first year of life, we probably are not celebrating taking care of, of our, our community. So you can see it's easy to get passionate. It's about saving babies' lives. It's about the quality of life itself. It's about who are we being as mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and who are we being as leaders in a community. So you can, you can gather your staff around that. You can um, call on donors. You can demand resources uh, for the fulfillment of that. When it's mission-driven, it seems somewhat easier. So I'll never forget, uh, I was working in the nonprofit sector in the San Francisco Bay Area, and this guy, Steve Jobs, started talking about Apple computers um, with a mission. And I thought, what the hell? There's uh, computers, a mission to save the world. And then I realized that's one smart guy. And this is before the whole world realized that was one smart guy. Little Stevie Jobs from Palo Alto, California. He uh, came from my community and is younger than I am. So, you know, this kid. And he started getting everyone excited at Apple about changing the world through their computers. So he stole from the social profit sector, the use of a mission, and used it for his very for-profit sector, <laughs> very profitable, especially today, and got the staff all excited, and they were working hours like we were working. We were working in Africa and India, and we worked around the clock, and all of a sudden, you know, down in Santa Clara and Cupertino and Palo Alto, California, they were working around the clock for this, what I thought was this crazy little machine. And I, I then I, I stopped being uh, so territorial and began to realize, well, wouldn't that be great if all of us adopted mission-driven work? If all of us identified individually and personally, what is my mission? What am I here for? Given it's very transient, we all die. We all live for some years, some months in some cases, and then we die. And what will your life have been for? For the sake of what are you here? We would ask ourselves. And that's what I ask my clients in leadership. No matter what your role, what are you up to? What are you hoping for? What do you hope will be written on your gravestone by loved ones? And I'm asking you to think about it now. Is, is it, as some people say, I want to leave the world a little bit better than I found it? 
Other people say, I'm here to share love. Other people say, I'm here to, to give an innovative new idea to the world and see where they take it. What, what do you say? What is your personal mission? And I'm going to ask you to share it with someone in a moment. So think about it just for a moment. Another thing in the mission-driven sector that we do, that, that I bring to leadership consulting now, my clients, by the way, are primarily uh, people who've made it in their field, whether it is in Silicon Valley or uh, at universities. I work with a lot of healthcare systems, um, uh, transplant pro organ transplant programs uh, that... And these people have, have succeeded in their field. But I'll ask them, have you fulfilled your, your life's mission? And what is the, are you using your leadership position to serve the world? Are you, are you happy with, with yourself? So in the, uh, Again, the mission-driven area, what we learned about leadership is what is your mission? Rally around the mission. Focus on the mission. Get the resources for the mission. And be happy with resources. I've had many wonderful talks with my friend Anne um, about money. And money has been so tarnished. Money has been used to oppress Money has been used to wage wars. Money has been used to separate people by hierarchical differences. And I say, take money back. Take money back, embrace it as a resource for the fulfillment of a mission worth doing. So get yourself a mission. Get the resources to fulfill the mission. Easier to do if you really believe in what you're doing. Much easier to do if you believe in what you're doing. Very hard to get resources if you know down deep they'll be used not for the greater good, but in fact perhaps for the greater bad. Really hard then. So why do that anyway? Why waste any time doing that? So gather the resources to fulfill your mission uh, with great enthusiasm and you have two of the, of the great keys to the fulfillment of your leadership. Then there's a whole other dimension I wanted to mention to you. And, and that is, I was the CEO of an organization called The Hunger Project, reducing infant mortality rate uh, and working around the world. And a little bit similar to what Claudia said, I, I was the CEO, I was young, I was celebrated, I was doing good things, you know. <laughs> And I took a meditation intensive with a great meditation teacher from India. And in this intensive, we were meditating. And, uh, and I was thinking, yeah, but what about hunger? What about poverty? What, I don't have time to do this. What am I doing? And the meditation teacher s suggested, what if, she said, what if all the hunger all the poverty, all the violence in the world was simply a reflection of your inner state. What if it is simply a reflection of our collective inner state, that we have inner war, inner turbulence, inner anger, inner hostility, and it is reflected out in letting our children die. It is reflected out in the horrors that we, that we see happening around the world. She suggested that what if, and she said later, what if you, Catherine Parrish, you arrogant <laughs> young woman, I was young then, uh, what if you, your inner state, is more the perpetuation of this condition of hunger than it is part of the solution. I was horrified. Can you imagine? And I was pretty angry. I thought it was very rude of her to, <laughs> to suggest this. And 
I'll, ne I'll never forget that. I, I, I left. I was confused. I wanted to reject it. I, I didn't want that to, didn't want to consider that. It, I already had it that the bad guys were the 1% and the bad guys were the ones who were not sharing resources or, except there were many kind people who were like that. So, so I, I stumbled with it for some time and, and finally embraced it and said, okay, I, as Michael Jackson said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. <laughs> I'm going to, to work right here. And uh, so that was many years ago, and I've meditated every day since then. And uh, it, it has not yet totally transformed, but it's uh, making a huge difference, uh, I feel, in my inner state. And therefore, the environment that I've become, that one more aspect of leadership, and then I'm going to do an exercise, and then I'll complete for you, is... I feel that we as leaders, uh, we are an environment and we invite other people in. When we have a conversation, when we sit next to someone in an airplane, have you ever noticed that? Someone sits next to you on an airplane and all of a sudden you can feel their vibration. <laughs> all of a sudden you're, you're, th you're thinking, well, or they sit next to you and you feel calmer or more at ease. We have a vibration. We have an environment. You and I create uh, either warmth and connectivity or whatever we create. We're little walking environments. And as leaders... We create an environment that matters very, very much. The, the people who report to you, the people whose, whose jobs depend upon you are looking constantly for your approval, your connection, your, your permission to be free, to express themselves, to give their magic to the job and to the world. And I encourage you to consider the inner state that you project as a leader to your children and your families, to your organizations, uh, to everyone you touch as a major, major part of your expression of leadership. So that the three elements then are what is your mission, how do you measure, I'm sorry, there are four. How do you measure its fulfillment? How do you garner the resources to sustain that fulfillment? And who do you need to be to be the fulfillment of that mission? Who do you need to be to be the change you are committed to seeing? Who do you need to be? What is the ontological state of being? What do you need to call forth in yourself such that you can give that which is yours to give? So your gift is received. And when you leave the planet, whether you are cremated or put in a grave or what people are saying is, yes, he, he gave me freedom or he gave me laughter or he, uh, he helped us to create the healing hotels of the world, or he connected us, or she, uh, m something that resonates with you. So your assignment at this very moment, please, is to write down whatever comes to mind. What is your personal mission? And it can be very short. It can be to share love. It can be to express myself authentically. It can be to create an environment for others. It can be to be the best swimmer on the planet. What is your mission? In one sentence or so, please write something down, whatever comes to mind. What is your mission in a very short, and you're going to need to share it with your neighbor in just a moment. What is your mission? Secondly, who do you need to be? Who do you need to become to fulfill your mission? So you're making a to-be list, not a to-do list. Who do you need to be? Do you need to be loving? Do you need to be compassionate? Do you need to be rigorous? Do you need to be expressive? 
Do you need to be, who do you need to be to fulfill that mission you just said is your mission? Who are you calling forth here? What is your authentic self-expression? So the two questions, what is your mission? Who do you need to be? So when you've got something, please turn to the person next to you or behind you if there's no one next to you. And so two, four, six. Can you be a threesome there? Make sure you have someone, please. And share your mission and your to-be list. part of it. Oh, oh it? a connection. Karma. <laughs> oh, yes. It's a, this is what I call a, a mission-driven group of human beings. That uh, It's lovely to meet people from mission, isn't it? From, it's like meeting from heart. And just finally, as, as I complete, that uh, it, it seems to me that leadership lives in being aware or conscious or at choice. And all of the very bad things we do to each other as human beings are done from fear or reaction or some kind of survival that's very basic. And if we can help each other step up above uh, our fear, if, if we can intervene when we hear fear being, being catalyzed, uh, just intervene, just step up and say, it's, it's not like that for me. I appreciate your opinion, but for me, it's not like that. If we can uh, be authentic, be courageous enough, and courageous, cool, cool, heart, heart, come from your heart enough to dare speak up, to, to get what you need to thrive. Uh, whoa, what an environment you'll create for everyone around you. When I became an executive, the first time I dared um, admit to people that I was leaving work, and remember, my work was to end world hunger, so I was leaving this serious work <laughs> to go watch my little girl play in her first soccer game. I remember people, you know, are a little bit like this, but then it allowed my whole staff, we had hundreds of, of staff, to go to their child's soccer game, for goodness sake. How can you say we're being, we're being a world that works for everyone as an organization, uh, but we're lying when we go to the soccer game? I used to put in my, my calendar, because everyone could see my calendar, you know, meeting with initials, my daughter's <laughs> initials, but I didn't think, <laughs> meeting with SMP. <laughs> I'm off to the, and, and you know, Ah, it, it's like, uh, so I encourage you in your life, where, wherever that happens in your life, um, have the, the courage to intervene. Go for it. It'll bring truth, awareness, choice, love, cool, all of it from the heart. And it will slay fear with one blow, slay fear. And the chance then for who, who you can be in the environment you can create it is limitless. And what people will produce when they're freed and respected and have choice is limitless. And we can create a world that works for everyone with no one and nothing left out. And can you imagine what it will do to the healing hotel industry? It'll just go, wah, wah. Because who doesn't want to give that to as a gift to one another? My God. It's, oh, it's, thank you, I've taken more time than permitted. A, a pleasure to be with you. I appreciate it very much.